good. So uh, today we're going to talk about solubility by radicals. So to motivate the subject, we're just going to look at the polynomial over Q, x squared plus bx plus c. As we all have learned in high school, this is uh, true if and only if x is equal to negative v plus minus the square root of <laughs> b squared minus 4c over 2, right? OK, so we notice that this can be solved by adjoining to Q the square root of B squared minus 4AC, which is an element of Q. Okay? So by only adjoining a root, we're able to get both solutions of this uh, equation. Where it's equal to zero. <laughs> Sorry. So uh, so we're able to get the solutions by just adjoining one one root. So more generally, slightly more generally, similar. and cube roots are needed for the cubic. And a similar statement hold for cortex. So uh, it, it was known, but uh, it was known relatively long after that the quintic, so the general quintic, uh, cannot be solved by radicals, by taking roots. So this, this is an, a well-known fact nowadays, but it took people sort of a long time to come up with a structured proof. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to look at which equations are solvable, namely uh, polynomial <laughs> equations, and which cannot. So to start, we have to define what we mean by solved or solvability by radicals. So, uh, a little unfortunate is the terminology used. As you have probably noticed that I use the word solubility instead of solubility. And perhaps mathematicians were illiterate back then. Perhaps they didn't know that a word can take on multiple meanings. This is somewhat ironic because they must have been normal mathematicians. OK, so uh, definition. Polynomial P in Fx. Let me get this right. Let me write this on the left hand side. Unfortunate word solvable. solvable. It should have been soluble by radicals. So this. If there exists a sequence of fields. Fn. 
which is equal to fn minus 1 at joint wn. And these wi's satisfy uh, when you raise it to a positive integer power, you end up back in the previous field. In other words, we're adjoining the r one root to f0. We're adjoining r tooth root of w2 to f1, and so on, until we reach the final field in which uh, a certain thing happens, such that uh, p splits. And these are positive integers. OK, so this is what we mean by sol uh, solubility. solubility. And uh, in the picture, we have the top field Fn, and then you have Fn minus 1, and then you have F2. Each of these extensions is degree uh, r i. Oops, uh, r n rather. Here we go. And furthermore, uh, every time you go up, you adjoin a radical, a, a root. So this uh, this property of being solvable by radicals is in fact and existential, right? So we notice, ex uh, we notice immediately that this property is about the existence of a chain of intermediate subfields. Okay, so, and we have seen from last time that we can use the fundamental theorem of Galois theory to establish a correspondence between this chain and another chain, reversed chain, where the bottom element is E, and the top element is the top to bottom Galois group, Fn to F. And each of these will correspond in reverse order to the intermediate chain between this group and this group. So, uh, let's call this G1. And then this is Gn minus 1. Should have got it. Last one is GN. Okay. And so the so from the fundamental theorem we're able to deduce that this exists if and only if this exists. And furthermore, this chain had some extra properties P that puts a constraint, not, not just any chain, right? This chain has to satisfy some properties. So in this instance, the properties are uh, the, the exact nature of each field, namely that it is the previous field adjoining a radical, and the fact that P splits in Fn. Okay, so these are the properties P. And our work is to establish a, an equivalent characterization over here in this diagram. We, we translate these properties P into equivalent properties P prime. So that a chain satisfying p prime exists over here, if and only if a chain exists over here with property p. Okay, so that's our that's our uh, strategy. So this was the strategy we saw last time, and we're going to use it again. So anybody notice immediate problems? What's the problem here? So right, so we wish to look at the Galois group and decide whether it has a chain that satisfies P prime. If it does, then it's soluble, solvable. If it doesn't, then it's not solvable. But what's the problem here? Does this even make sense? When does the fundamental theorem hold? When, when this is a normal extension. So note, we must have Fn normal. So in other words, 
towards uh, this extension uh, normal. Okay, so this is not immediately guaranteed by the definition because it, we merely require that it splits in Fn. It doesn't have to be precisely the splitting field of P, it could be bigger. Fn could be much bigger than the splitting field of P and therefore not normal. Not necessarily normal. Okay, so, uh, so that's our first goal, is that this, while this is a very natural definition to put as this, the definition of solubility by radicals, we don't automatically have normality. But it turns out that this is not necessary. It turns out that this chain exists, if and only if a much nicer chain exists. So that's our next theorem. Um, let uh, a field, let f be a field of characteristic zero. So this is important, otherwise I can't carry out the algorithm to turn just this chain into a nicer one. So let f be a field of characteristic zero. So now we're guaranteed that my algorithm works. Um, the next thing that I'm going to write is essentially saying that I can turn this chain into another one in which the top field is normal over the bottom one. Uh, P in Fx solvable by radicals over F implies uh, there exists a chain uh, L0 equals F L1 L0 adjoin alpha 1 to L uh, K. Did I use K? Yes. Equals LK minus 1 adjoin alpha K. Such that, again, we satisfy all of these criteria, namely uh, alpha 1 to the S1 is in F, well, L0. Alpha k to the sk is in lk minus 1. Okay? And such that lk is, well, such that lk is normal. So this is important. And lk. Uh, and P splits in LK. Okay, so that's our uh, goal, is to prove that this holds. In other words, we're building another sequence in which the final member is, uh, uh, contains all the roots of P. And furthermore, we are careful enough in our selection of the alpha i's so as to, so as to achieve a normal extension at the end. Okay, so that, that's, the, that's the gist of the theorem. So the proof goes like this. So by definition, uh, the thing I just erased exists. So uh, there exists k naught equals f, k1 equals uh, k naught adjoint w1. Is did I use M? Yes. Is equal to K M minus one between W M and W M to the R M is K M minus one. Okay. So now so actually can you guess where I'm gonna go from here? Like it should be pretty clear. So you have a field that doesn't quite reach what you want. So what do you do? Right, so what does it mean for you to not be normal? It means you have no friends, right? So it means uh, you have a root of some polynomial, but then all the other roots of that same polynomial are not with you. Right, so that's, that's uh, what's happening. So instead of just, let's adjoin w1 and forget about that w1. Let's not, right? Let's adjoin w1 and then put in all of their friends, right? Put in all of its friends. And then adjoin w2, and then put in all of its friends, 
and so on. And then we're guaranteed to have the normally closed extension at the end, right? So, uh, so how do we tell who are the friends of W1? What's the quickest way? Remember, we have to do this for like m steps, so we may as well optimize for the uh, m steps at the same time, right? So, for convenience, let's call this k, the final field that wasn't normal. We know that uh, k over m is finite, is a finite extension. By the, and because uh, characteristic of f is zero, this is separable, right? So in the cleanest way possible, we're going to say k is equal to f and join a by the primitive element theorem. Our goal is to construct a new sequence, and let's call this final one L. We wish for L to be normal over F. Now we know what L is. L is the splitting field of the minimal polynomial of A. our final member in our sequence. And because it is the that because it is the splitting field of some polynomial, it is automatically normal. So now our job is to fill in the intermediate uh, uh, intermediate fields adjoining uh, one radical at a time and reach L. And we do this precisely by in friendship order, right? We first adjoin W1. Then we adjoin all the other roots of W1 of the same minimal polynomial, and so on. But we're going to be a little bit more streamlined in the sense that we're going to immediately take G, L, F. And then this will tell us the friendship functions, right? They are the uh, automorphisms of the field that fix F. Let's list them. The reason I call these the friendship functions is that by applying each of these to some root of a polynomial, you figure out who their friends are. <laughs> right. so, uh, so let's call that E. Well, call E that. And uh, uh, note that K was F adjoined A, but it's also F adjoin all the w1s, uh, wi successfully, right? That's our original construction of the k, uh, of the field k, is by successfully adjoining radicals. It's just that by the primitive element theorem, we found one thing to adjoin that gets the whole thing, right? So uh, this tells us that polynomial expressions in A are polynomial expressions in the wi's. I should call this property star. fields are equal, and by definition, well, by a theorem, this was f adjoint a, and this was f adjoint w1. Okay. So uh, polynomials in here are the same as polynomials in here. If you don't, if you don't remember this, simply say rational functions in a are simply rational functions in w dots. Okay. So uh, now. Can anybody tell me over here T is equal to the size of G? And 
Uh, can anybody tell me what, uh, why this is the case? Um, that f adjoin w1 to wm, and then uh, adjoin sigma1 of w1 uh, all the way to sigma1 of wm, why this equals f a sigma1 of a. Hint, star. Okay. Polynomial expressions in this can be decomposed into a polynomial expression in A and then a polynomial expression in sigma 1 of A. Right? You can think of this as f adjoint A and then adjoint sigma 1 of A. So the coefficients in front of the powers of sigma 1 of A come from uh, sigma of A, or uh, come from uh, f adjoint A. So because A by star is an expression in the uh, polynomial expression in the WIs, by the homomorphicity of sigma 1, you can split it across the WIs. And so these generators are enough to create any polynomial expressions in here. For example, uh, sigma 1 of a squared plus 3a, well, sigma 1 of a squared plus 3 sigma 1 of a uh, times a, right? This expression is actually uh, sigma 1, uh, say, say a was, I don't know, w3 plus w2 squared, right? Then this is uh, w3 plus w2 squared plus 3 sigma 1 of w3 plus w2 squared times a. Then this, because this is an automorphism of the field, sigma 1 of w3 plus You're sigma 1. You're missing a square on that. Oh, sorry. Uh, plus sigma 1 of w2, all squared, squared, plus 3 sigma 1 of w3, plus sigma 1 of w2, squared, times a. Oh look, this is a polynomial expression in this uh, sigma 1 of wi's and of the wi's themselves, once I expand this a out into w3 plus w2, squared. So as claimed, these generators are, in, are these generators are indeed to express everything in here. Okay, so that's why they're equal. Proceeding by induction like this, it is not hard to see that by adjoining all of our friends this way, we do get the final field. tells you who your conjugate friends are, right? If you're, the, if you're a solution of your own minimal polynomial, then you must have siblings, right? You must have other friends. And these tell you how to get them. You apply these to yourself. Okay, so uh, being normal means you have all of your friends. Okay, so let's see. Uh, in what order shall we adjoin these? Because each of these is a radical. Right? When, you, when you raise it to some power, you get back to some previous field. But we have to be careful about the order here. Right? So we do proceed by friend order. So we do this. We first go throw in w1. Oh, by the way, right? Like this, this is why we failed to begin with. We stopped here right? when we got to k. Okay? So the moral of the story is take your friends along, and then you'll get to f. So uh, you, you, you throw in w1, and then you throw in its friends. So sigma, so w1, sigma1, w1. Then you throw in the other ones, w1, sigma1, w1. Dot, dot, uh, sigma t minus 1, w1. Okay, so 
Okay? So once you throw in all the friends of W1, then you go on to throw in the friends of W2. Uh, let's call this F super 1. It's like F super 1 is contained in F super 1 W2 is contained in F super 1 W2 sigma 2 W uh, sigma 1 W2 one of its friends uh, F1 W2 sigma 1 W2 sigma t minus 1 w2, like this, okay? And that's f2. And finally, I can do the vertical dot dot dot, and the horizontal dot dot dot, and then uh, call, call it done. So this last thing is l, because we threw in everything in here, which is f l. Okay? So this is the order in which we will proceed. We throw in w1 and all of its friends, and then we throw in w2 and all of its friends, and so on. Let us now check that each new thing we throw in is in fact a radical of the previous thing. And in explaining this, it is nice to have a matrix ID. Well, not matrix, but like a table. some stage, right? At any stage. At any stage. Uh, L sub S, so is equal to L, the previous one, adjoins some sigma i wj, right? So, uh, so, well, we Note that at any stage. Um, this contains contains F of sigma I of U one sigma I W2 all the way up to sigma i wj. Okay? So that's why we chose this order. Yes. Okay? So uh, in the matrix picture, suppose we just adjoin something here. Sigma, let's say sigma 2 wj. Okay, suppose we just adjoin sigma 2 wj, then we have all of these. Okay, we have all of these things. That's the observation we want to make. Okay? No matter where we are, this is always true because we went this order. Okay, we have everything above it adjoined to f. So that's the crucial observation we want to make. So now when we raise when we raise sigma i wj, this is this element, to the uh, to the rj. Remember rj was our very first exponent, right? The very the very first chain that we were not satisfied with because the top was not normal. These rj's are the exponents. Okay? So when we raise it to the rj, we hope that this is equal to sigma i wj rj, but 
this was in kj minus 1. Okay, but this is a subset of f, uh, a join sigma i of u1, sigma i of u2, sigma i of uj minus 1, which is a subset of the, which is a subset of the predecessor. So this is by star star applied to L S minus one. Yes. No. Okay. So basically we're just checking that when you raise it to the like right when we raise it to the uh, power R J, we want to make sure that it lands in the previous uh, field, and it does. Because it contains everything of so, and a column is a sigma i shift of k, right? This whole column, when adjoined to f, is k. This whole column, when adjoined to k, uh, when adjoined to f, is sigma one of k. Another subfield of L, when I add. Okay, and similarly, every when you adjoin everything in the column, you get sigma uh, j uh, sigma i of k the sigma i shift of k. Okay, so, um, but the thing is, when you're, when you're only partially done, you only got to sigma i, sigma i of kj. Right, so, uh, does that make sense? So if, if I stop in the middle, say here at wj, then I have only gone up to kj. And I haven't gone to k yet. So, uh, just think about this argument, if you're still confused. Okay, so, are there any questions? So now we have checked everything. So now we have produced a new sequence that ends up being a normal uh, uh, extension of f. So um, believe it or not, this is still not the chain we want. It's, it's, we're still not satisfied with this chain, even though the top is now normal. So we still need to throw in a little bit more constraint on that. Okay? So however, that's easy to build. So I have written blurb here. It says, uh, from this chain, from this new chain of the L's, I'm going to write it the correct way now. And uh, Li is equal to Li minus 1, a joint alpha i, where alpha i to the si is given alpha minus 1. So when we have this chain, it's easy to modify it into one that we like. And this is what we're going to do next. So, what we want, actually, is that each individual extension is normal. Right now, we just have this is normal, right, top to bottom. We want to make each individual thing normal. This causes us to actually look at the problem now, instead of doing just field theory. So now we use, so now we prove something of, uh, that is only true about radicals. So now we use the fact that these are, now we use the ad hoc properties of radicals, basically. And this is where all the creativity is going to do, uh, going to uh, go. So basically what we're about to do is to find out, is to, is to partially translate P. Remember we said there's a bunch of properties P about the intermediate fields chain? We want to translate it to properties about the group chain. 
So we're going to do some. Do we're going to do some of that translation now. So from now on, our ground field will be Q. Uh, it can be uh, generalized to fields of characteristic zero, but it's easiest to do it for Q, and then you'll see how to do it for every other field. So whenever we have a radical extension, all we're doing is adjoining a root of x to the n minus a, this polynomial. Whenever we have a radical extension, we're doing this, where we're adjoining a root of this to get to the next field. Um, it turns out that if our ground field f already had uh, contains e to the 2 pi i over n, namely the nth, one of the nth roots of unity that's primitive, so a primitive nth root of unity, then all the future extensions will automatically be normal. So this is the observation we want to make. So any future extension will be normal, as long as it is radical. So uh, say we want to do cube root of some element b. This will be normal, as long as it already has this element. Okay, so that's where we want to go next. So, and then, of course, this will have this element too. And then when you adjoin radical, it will again be normal. So that's where we want to go next. So first, uh, we want to prove this. Oops. So this is a simple theorem about our initial adjoining. We want to do. Uh, uh, so we want to do q, and then we want to do f is equal to q adjoin e to the two pi i over n. And we said if we start here, then every future adjoining is normal, right? So we want to show that this is good in some sense. So this theorem tells us about this initial step, uh, about this. So. Already, this expression gave it away, right? This is the, this is the minimal polynomial of this. Well, not minimal polynomial, but it's a, a eliminating polynomial of this. Um, right. So then, Q x is the splitting field. surprisingly, and more importantly, now that it is normal, g, q, x, what's the strongest statement you can make about this? You're not telling me. Okay, first of all, don't get you, don't get the illusion where you're telling me. You're not. I'm not. I'm not asking you to describe the structure of the roots. I'm asking you to describe the structure of the permutations of the roots, right? That preserve the Q adjoint X. Sorry. Oops. 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 Sorry, I was uh, brain farting. And also this one. Sorry. Call this W sub n from now on. What is the strongest statement you can make about this group of automorphisms? The roots look like. Okay, but that's not the structure I'm asking you about, right? I'm asking you about the field structure preserving automorphisms that send these roots around. Are you asking what? I'm asking you about this. <laughs> G, Q, E to the 2 pi over N, Q. What, what is the strongest adjective you can put here? And this adjective will become the, oh, the focal point of abelian. all of our view. Yes, abelian. OK, so basically, our entire next uh, lecture and also the next 15 minutes will revolve around this word. Pretty sure cyclic is stronger than a billion. 
<laughs> well, okay. Uh, it turns out that it doesn't matter. It turns out that abelian is all we have to say, and it's equivalent to saying abelian. Wait, what? Yes. So uh, this is all we need to prove the if and only. So therefore, it doesn't matter. Does that make sense? You, you just said that saying abelian is equivalent to saying abelian. I believe that. Oh, no, 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 no. Like, <laughs> we don't need to prove something stronger in order to prove the if and only. OK. And hence, in a philosophical sense, this is the strongest uh, we can say. <laughs> right? OK. So uh, for, the, for our purposes. So, OK. So uh, proof. <clears throat> By the way, if you claim that it's stronger, uh, Write down more properties about this that you know, aside from abelian. That's a homework test exercise. So proof. Is that in? Is that in? No, no, not fine. There's a bunch So uh, proof on uh, the list W n one W n squared all the way to W n n minus one is. Uh, Full list of roots. are able to be generated from this element alone. And being a splitting field, it has to contain at least one of these roots. So it's both at least as big and at most as big. Therefore, it's equal. OK, so, so why is this a billion? Well, I'm not going to write too well. Uh, let sigma be in G. Sigma is entirely determined by its action on Wn. After all, everything in this field is a polynomial expression in Wn. So if you know sigma of Wn, you can determine the rest of the value of sigma. Hence, also, sigma sends Wn to another root of f of x. Hence, sigma of Wn is equal to Wn to the i for some i. If tau is another element, We see that sigma of tau of Wn, first of all, their identity on f, so that's boring. So it remains to check that sigma tau equals tau sigma on Wn is equal to sigma of, oh, then similarly, uh, tau of sigma Wn is equal to Wn to the, to, to the j or some j. Thus, say sigma of tau wn is equal to sigma of wn to the j, which is equal to sigma of wn to the j, which is equal to wn to the i j, which is equal to wn to the j i, which I'm going to abbreviate this backwards, is equal to tau of sigma wn. Okay. So that's why, therefore, sigma tau equals tau sigma. Thus, boy, th this statement hides the fact that uh, this is identity on f. And also, it's de and, and because it's determined by uh, w, then this is true. I'm hiding a lot of details. So thus, uh, 
G Q W N Q that's Amelia. Okay. So that's it. any questions so far? So that uh, that gets us a very nice starting point. It says that if we start with Q and then we immediately extend it using W N for some any N we want. Then what's going to happen is, uh, in, in its Galois correspondence, this group is a mutant. Uh, here we have G, L, Q, and here we have G. Uh, and furthermore, this extension is actually normal. You got all of its other roots by adjoining one of the primitive ones. Uh, this is G L Q W N. Right? And that uh, that quotient is a bit because this extension, the middle to bottom extension that is normal, corresponds to a quotient. The top to middle corresponds to actual things in the labs. And the middle to bottom corresponds to quotients. So I'm going to say G L Q over G. L Q W N. This is a uh, abelian. And then you seem to be. Did, is anything wrong? This group represents this extension, and that is represented by this quotient. Okay, so that's the middle to bottom, the harder generation. So now that the, so uh, our goal of achieving stepwise normality starts here, right? This this step is in fact normal, and then from here on, every step will be normal, as we will see. By the way, what should I pick n to be? Some kind of least common multiple of all the powers involved, right? That's the kind of, OK. So um, that is the sneak peek to what we're going to pick n to be. It's going to be the least common multiple of all the ri's, the, the, the powers you need to raise to get back to the previous yield, namely the, uh, the order of each radical. Right? So OK. So, uh, the next theorem and the final one we will prove today is a simple one too. It's going to be let uh, so it's going to just tell us that the future extensions are going to be good as well. So let f be a finite extension field.
Okay, now I'm going to state the first line. Then, uh, same thing. Then, that u is the splitting field. Splitting field of f. Of f over f. And, now we can say more. And g f u f is hint of order dividing n. A billion. <laughs> A billion of order dividing n. Mm. Sickly. I guess that also makes sense because order also is the size of the group. Mm -hmm. But here I, I think both that the cycle length uh, and the size are both uh, the same number and the dividing. So the proof is easy. The list, uh, what did I call it? WN. Uh, yeah, U. WN U. WN squared U. WN to the N minus 1 U. Is a, is a complete list of n distinct points of f. And therefore, remember, the field f already contains e to the 2 pi i n, so I can freely use wf. And therefore, F that join U is the splitting field of F over F. Okay? And the reason why the reason why it is cyclic is equally as easy, because the proof will look exactly like the one we just did. So, again, sigma is entirely determined by its action on u. Any sigma in g f u f is entirely determined by its action on u, as before. Now we're going to make a homomorphism from this group. Define a homomorphism. Uh, call it C, going from G M U to F. So basically, sigma is going to still do exponent manipulations, right? It's got to send a root to some other root. So it's going to manipulate the exponent on the Ws. So, uh, say sigma of u is, I don't know, w n to the i u, okay? Then it's, then it's just going to shift everything i steps forward. <laughs> so that's the, that's what's going to happen. And obviously this is the math I'm going to use. Uh, G f u f to this group. And it's going to do the obvious thing, g of sigma equals i, where uh, sigma of u is equal to wi, because this is a list of distinct elements, and it has to send u to one of these elements. i is uniquely determined. Okay, so, uh, and, and here, i is the equivalence class containing the integer i, if you want. So, okay, so, uh, any questions about this map? <laughs> okay, so psi sigma tau is equal to psi. So, first of all, sigma tau of u is equal to sigma w to. So sigma of u is w to the i u, and tau u is w j u. So say. 
this is equal to sigma of w to the j sigma of u, right? But w, which uh, I should say wn, wn was in f. Wn is in f. And sigma is in g f u f, so it fixes f. In particular, it fixes this. So this is wn to the j. Sigma of u, which we said was wn i. Okay? And then now, of course, the i plus j comes in. Okay? And addition. Oh, I should say this is under addition, right? Without, without mention. <laughs> Otherwise, this may not even be a group under multiplication. Okay, so uh, this uh, is this, and therefore psi of sigma tau is equal to i plus j, which is equal to psi of sigma plus psi of tau, as claimed. I claimed something. <laughs> and uh, so that claim is now shown. And of course, by the first isomorphism theorem, this uh, image is isomorphic to um, kernel of psi. And uh, the image actually is, uh, what am I trying to say? The image is a subgroup of a cyclic group and therefore cyclic. Okay? So as long as we prove this is injective, we're done. And it is obviously injective. Note, it is injective. We'll get done. <laughs> because if if two if two field automorphisms in here share the same I, then they're forced to be the same automorphism because they're entirely determined by where they send you. Okay, so this is clearly uh, injective. So note. So it's injective, obviously. I'm not going to say anything more. Thus, her is uh, just the trivial group. Results next time to construct the, the the golden tower we really want, having each successive extension normal and the whole thing normal, and then using that as our uh, entry entryway for our Galois theoretic attack on this problem. By attack, I mean of course translating the collection of properties P into an equivalent uh, uh, collection of properties P prime about the chain of subgroups of the Gamma group. So are there any uh, uh, questions? Okay, so thanks for coming.